So are gay people allowed to have differing opinions? Hmm. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name's Jack, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been really enjoying making all of this content and thanks again for everyone's kind comments. Hope you continue coming back. And today I would actually like to do my first reaction video. Never done one of those before. And I've also taken no notes, so I'm just gonna wing it, see how it goes, hopefully I'll be able to come up with some intelligent answers. Um, but I absolutely love Jubilee Middle Ground. I'm sure lots of you have seen it on this show. They talk about key topics, getting speakers in from contrasting sides, sometimes different sides of the political spectrum. It's supposed to be civilized, a way for people to find common ground, see that although you come from different backgrounds, when you come from different sides of the political spectrum, that we can still agree on certain issues. We have four men from the liberal side and four men from the conservative side. This is in the US, so I mean, I live in the UK. I might try and apply some of that to here. Like, how does that play out? And let's go into it. I'm gonna see what I think of this. Okay. The gay community is over-sexualized. I'm gonna say if I will walk over or not and then we can give my thoughts as I can go in. So the gay community is over-sexualized. I'm gonna say yes. I'm walking forward on this one. Can the agreeers please step forward? Okay, so we've got two liberals and... The gay community because all the conservatives. You know, it's based off of there. our sexual attraction. It has a very easy time going into a space that's all about sex. To me, being gay is a lot more than who I sleep with, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's an experience from when I grew up. The True. movement used to be about love, but then you go to a pride parade now and you're seeing old men with their genitals out. I think everybody has a right to like express their sexuality in, in the ways that they do it. So on those grounds, I'm not like offended by these old people like right. <laughs> doing what I they're do doing. What do. But I do agree with that. I think like one of the biggest challenges when I was coming out to my dad, who's Muslim, it was like my sexuality being gay isn't just about my sexual lust for other men. It's right. more about the spiritual connections, the in-depth things. Like me as a whole complex person, I do think that our experiences and our existence has kind of been trivialized by the over-sexualizations. I don't think it's inherently an evil, but... The over so, yeah, I completely agree with both, with both of those points. I mean, is it over-sexualized? Absolutely. Do we have a history of being viewed as unsavory, slutty? Absolutely. Now, also, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I mean, one of the things I love about being gay in the LGBT community is the sexual liberation that we sort of receive. I think society grants us a lot more in terms of expressing ourselves in a sexual way and being open about our sexual experiences. At least I've definitely had that experience with, you know, speaking to straight people and how, I don't know, like maybe they give me more of a license to express and experiment in that stuff than they might do, you know, a woman like who, you know, typically face a lot more slut shaming. Now, the thing is, when people ask, why are we over-sexualized? I think it is down to two main reasons. So the first is obviously being gay was taboo. It was, you know, illegal. It was looked down upon, discriminated against. So naturally the gays found their underground way of hooking up. You know, we had cruise culture. Um, it was all very insidious, right? It was like under the table. So I guess with that comes an act of rebellion uh, you can start pushing the borders even further. You can start experimenting with maybe more risque stuff. That's a, like if society already doesn't accept you, then you might as well just be like, okay, well, let's just do all the other things. Society doesn't accept us as well. So I think that's one of it. It's sort of the sexual liberation side. But then also, you know, I don't believe gender is a social construct. I believe that there are very much clear differences between men and women on average. And then we have people of different non-conforming degrees that cross over. And when it comes to sexual attraction, sexual behavior, men are very different to women. So like in general, men will be more visual with their sexual attraction. They will be less choosier with mates. I mean, the whole procreation model is, you know, more advantageous for men to try and spread their seed as much as possible to procreate. Whereas women, more advantageous for them to be choosier with their mates so that they find someone who will be reliable, provide for them, protect them. Now, this is just like the fundamental mammal situation of our bodies, okay? I'm not saying that anyone should be one thing or the other. Look down on women that are, you know, quote unquote slutty. Absolutely not. I think that's great if you want to do that. I think that putting a bunch of gay men into on a cruise ship or, you know, in a nightclub together, it's like 
unleashing a bunch of toddlers in, in a sweet store with no adults, you know? They are going fucking crazy. In straight relationships, women are more the arbiters of sex, okay? So it's more their decisions sometimes, like, you know, whether it happens or not. Just a fact. But with men, the boundaries aren't there as much. It's easier to just go out there and get it. And, you know, I've seen this firsthand, like in nightclubs, people having sex in the stalls, you know, um, men are so into like glory holes, or you, you don't even see their face. It's just all about, you know, you know what? Everything with Grindr is just, I mean, if you've ever been on that app, you've seen that app, like the way men talk about each other, it's, it's, it's very blatantly like we're here for sex, hookups. Um, I do think that society allows it more, but I also think that it's very much down to that biological element. And there's also nothing wrong with that. Even though people might want to pretend this is because we were oppressed and marginalized and like we were trying to break free and be liberated, that may play a part. But I think as long as gay men will exist, this behavior will exist. And, you know, personally, I'm in a monogamous relationship and I love it. But so many of my gay friends are not and they like to be more risque with their sexual activity. And that's fine. Should society just view us as sexual and reduce us down to that? Absolutely not. But can we acknowledge why that's there? Yes. Sexualization is apparent in the apps that we can get. I mean, you can literally have sex on demand or mm -hmm. you could find it in a location wherever you want. Certain businesses Grindr. are actually keeping doors open like, because men are having that. sexual relations in the bathrooms and that's inappropriate. I mean, we want our privacy too, just like women. And now we can't even have our privacy because a small sect of men ruin it for us. Yeah, and that was really frustrating too. When I came out the closet, it was like I had this innate pressure, like, oh, I have to download Grindr, I have to be super yeah. sexualized, and that's really bad on our youth because mm -hmm. all of a sudden everyone has sex, I get that, but why is it that our community is so hyper-focused on that? I haven't attended many Pride events because of that reason, and I was able to go to Portugal and there was this... So exactly my point. I feel like people just, you know, they can only be, like, over here, over here. So I acknowledge why we're over-sexualized, why this, this happens, but then... Should we then say like, oh, because you're gay, like you have to do, you have to be into all this kinky stuff and you have to like have all these hookups? No. We can acknowledge like the averages and then we can also say, but if, you, if you're not into that, that's totally cool. Like you do you. But if you are into it, then that's also great. Nothing wrong with Grindr. At the end of the day, it kind of serves a purpose. Like some men just want to hook up and it is... It's like serving them that on a plate. It's kind of an arena which breaks down social norms and allows men to be like, this is what I want. I like tick, 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 tick. Like anyone out there gonna give it to me? Yes, no, okay, let's do it. If it's consensual and you're an adult, go for it. I don't think that there should be another side being like, oh, but we shouldn't have that because then people view us as too sexual. No, let's view each other as individuals. So. If you enter the gay community and you're like, oh, I just feel so much pressure to be like really sexual. Like, who cares? If anyone's putting pressure on you to be really sexual and to like get down with our level, then they shouldn't be the people you're hanging out with. Like, absolutely not. I mean, I have to say that I have definitely felt that maybe four years ago or whatever, like the monogamous situation, I felt people would kind of look down on me for that or feel like I was like depriving myself. Like, oh, you poor thing, like only having sex with one person. Well, like I'm not because I genuinely don't want to have sleep with other men right now. And I'm happy with that. So if anyone is like trying to put you in a box, be it you shouldn't be over-sexualized or just not liberated, you need to embrace your sexual side. Both of those things aren't helpful. Let's try and as individuals ask ourselves, what do I want? What makes me happy? I do agree that Obviously, a lot of these narratives and stuff sometimes paint a light in the public of seeing our community as sort of predatorial or over-sexualized, which I mean, in recent years, is kind of an element of that. But in general, I think as we move more towards understanding the difference between men and women and that we have different needs and on average, we behave differently sexually, then we can accept that, yeah, some gay men are like that and nothing wrong with that. But there's also loads of gay men who are not. So... As long as we like keep things in private and we don't like parade it down the street, that is the sweet spot where we need to be. I haven't attended many Pride events because of that reason. And I was able to go to Portugal and there was this queer retreat. And it was like the first time I felt like safe and secure as a queer person because it wasn't sexual. And I could have this, these relationships with queer men, but there is no expectation to be sexual. That's exactly my point. He doesn't want to be that way. So then he went and found his people that are not into that. And that's what we should be doing. We should be finding 
the communities, not just be like, I'm gay, so therefore I need to be part of this like majority collective. I'm gay and I'm gonna find other gay men who have similar values to me. You know, there are gay Christian men, there are gay politicians, there are gay athletes, like whatever. Go, go, you go to a gay club, you're getting grabbed. You are, absolutely. You're getting you hugged, you're getting groped, absolutely. I mean, I avoid them at all costs. So I do have to agree with that. I've been out where someone has touched me inappropriately and I've been like, you can't just do that. And they've been all like defensive. So I do think that that's where the kind of like underground people hate us, people discriminated against us um, stuff comes in because when something is so secret and so taboo and it's not spoken about, sometimes you can go so far in normalizing behavior and culture that then people don't understand that it's inappropriate. So something I miss about like living in London is, you know, when I first started going out when I was like 23, those gay circles were so much fun. And like, I'm talking about mainly gay men. Okay, I'm gay, like it was fun. Whereas now everything has to be queer. Everything has to be like gender bending, kinky, like non-binary, like all of this stuff, right? So I feel like that community is really being lost and people look down on it, like that kind of mask, like gay for gay type thing. Yes, having a dark room or having sex in a bathroom stall was normalized, but is it better to be like straight up, like this venue does this, or like we have a dark room. If you're into that, come along. If you're not, don't. Is it not better to kind of keep that, but then also teach people like, if you're into this and someone else is great, but then that's not the norm. You don't just go up to someone and expect that. Okay, so we're gonna have the disagreeers come forward now. I think it's easy to generalize our communities over sexualized because we're in it, so we're focused on it. But if you look at the straight community, I think they're doing a lot of what we're doing, especially now with more sexual liberation becoming a thing for them and their community. I also think that we have to remember, like we've only been legal as in like decriminalized in our sex for 20 years this year. That's crazy every year up until 20 years ago, like there's going to be an explosion of people wanting to embrace their sexual liberation. And then you look at things like the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, like that took away so many people and it made us afraid to have sex. So this, in my opinion, is a way for us to overcome stuff and we definitely need to find a balance. Okay, so <clears throat> it kind of annoys me when people take stuff from the past and you know, I'm so sick of hearing the word appropriation, but I'm going to use it. So sort of appropriating past people's struggles for the sake of today in the 80s. Like, was this person alive then? I don't know. Like, maybe they were a baby. I think it's disrespectful personally to be like, oh, well, back then, you know, people like looked down on us. They thought we were dirty. So like, this is why like we should be sec. No, you did not live then. You don't know what those people went through. And the fact that you're using their struggle to kind of feel sorry for yourself. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't agree about this, like straight people are the same. Like, yes, there are depictions of sexual stuff of straight people in movies. Sometimes pop stars can like get a little raunchy, but it's very different to there being this culture of oh, people, you know, like in the bushes all the time. Like you don't see, at least I've seen straight people just at a parade, their parts out or getting caught, like having sex. I don't know, do you? Basis for making us illegal has always been based on sex. Right. And so being openly sexual in any way at all whatsoever is inherently a protest, inherently subversive. I mean, there are sexual things that happen in public that I'm sometimes uncomfortable with, but that doesn't mean that all the things we see and all the things our friends see represent the majority of experiences. A huge portion of LGBTQ people exist in zero public LGBTQ. That's not the point. Like, oh, well, so many LGBT people are not explicit in public. Yeah, we know. But we're saying, is the community over-sexualized in general? Also, yes. Why? Because these crazy white ringers are seeing us as all the same bunch of sheep. And then there are lefty people being like, you need to be sexually liberated. So <clears throat> it's those people. We don't just say, oh, well, you know, like 80% of people don't do that. That's not answering the question.
pretty defined and decent. Yeah. I've been well, in like when a, I, I'm in a 20 year relationship, a 20 year monogamous relationship with my husband. And I say husband, cute. even though we're not married, um, but we're not groping each other in public. We can pack, we, we joke around. When we walk into a room, they know we're together because we just, hands? we give, yes, absolutely. We hold, we show extra affection at home in the privacy of our home or okay. in the privacy of friends' homes because we feel comfortable in that. And you know that what that though is your specific preference for public affection. There are a million rom-coms out there for hetero with heterosexual people and a fun, funny thing seen in that movie Correct. is straight people having sex in some public space. Correct. Uh, this is a... I still don't think that's appropriate. I don't exactly. It's like, oh, well, straight people do it. Yeah. So? It's like, oh, a gay person attacks someone. It's like, oh, well, straight people attack people. Yeah. Necessarily yeah, do people okay. I don't necessarily do either. I'm just saying we're talking about personal I think preferences. I know, but yeah. I think a lot of times in this, and I don't disagree with what you guys said, no, but a no, lot no. of times what I'll hear is like, well, the straight people do this. And I always grew up saying, I clean my house before I tell somebody else to clean theirs. I am not straight. Right. Therefore, if straight people are doing something wrong and gay people are doing something wrong, I'm going to address the gay people that are doing something but wrong and not address the, like, the people who yeah. have been setting the stage for all of us to like follow suit with. You know, like we live in a heteronormative culture, like right. everything that we see is based off of the way that they exist. Yeah, like we do live in a heteronormative culture because most people exist in the binary and are attracted to the opposite sex. Nothing wrong with that. Like everyone's always saying, oh, but like it's so heteronormative. Yeah, it's because like you live in the world. This is the world. Like we're animals. Like you are the exception to the norm. I'm the exception to the norm. I like being the exception to the norm. Just because there's all these like hetero people walking around doing their hetero stuff. I'm not like, oh my God, the world. It's not gay enough. I don't care. But when he's saying that they set an example for us, I totally disagree with that. And again, it comes back to like, let men be men. Like gay men definitely went off and did their, their own thing. They weren't like dressing up in kink, being on sex swings and chaining each other to stuff in underground clubs, being like, oh, well, street people set the standard for this. No. Pride is still necessary. Um, all right, 83%, yes. So I'm gonna say yes, but you know, nuance Yeah, I here. think pride's necessary, but we need a PR revamp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we need a rebrand. Uh, I take a lot of issues with what I see at pride parades now, uh, just because, you know, as we discussed previously, I think that it, it's a little bit over-sexualized. We're celebrating essentially sex rather than love. And we have people running around riding bikes with their balls out in front of kids. And for me- Where are you seeing this? Yeah, what prides are you going to? Um, New York City and Seattle, both of those had naked people walking the streets. <laughs> it's it's the fact exist. that it is allowed because we have this shield of it's pride, don't mess with gay people because of our history, which is, is granted. Are but we, people but, are afraid to look at our culture and say, that's not acceptable. Because if straight people were walking around doing that, it would be a totally different discussion. I agree with that. So I think it's funny what the the guy with the denim vest said, because it's something I see a lot when like a conservative person or when someone says anything that goes against the leftist narrative, there's drag queens performing to kids in a sexual way. And then they go like, but where is that happening? That's not actually happening. Once someone says that, you know that that it's a losing battle because you're like, yeah, here are my receipts. It is it, it is happening. And you know, take what he says at face value. He's If he's saying that there are guys with their balls out on bikes, he's not just lying, but then he's like, where exactly are you seeing this? And then I, I totally agree. I think attitude towards LGBT communities at the moment has been such a massive overcorrection because obviously I think society in general feels really bad for discriminating against gay, lesbian, trans people for like so long and especially a lot of trauma from the AIDS epidemic, which I'm so empathetic for. But I think we've got to a stage now where people are still, they're, they're afraid to call out any bad behavior from an LGBT person just for that reason. And we can be, we can respect people and give them equal opportunities, treat them equally, but we can still call them out for their shit. I'm calling myself out for like all the crazy stuff that I used to believe in. If someone is out on the street, like getting naked, being a kink, and people are like, oh, but just leave them. It's like the gays, they just have their day. No, who are the people who are gonna be brave enough to stand up to LGBT people? They're gonna be on the right. So then people are like, oh my God, these crazy white ringers are trying to say gay people don't exist. They're trying to erase us. It's like, no, they're the only ones brave enough to actually call out this stuff because everyone on the other side knows that if they call it out, 
You're going to disown them. You're going to cancel them. That's exactly what's happening. That's the majority of the issue, though. I mean, the reality is that being visible, period, is vital. Absolutely. We, are, we, we can be none of us will, being sexual. Yeah, none of us will be alive to see the day when heterosexual people and homosexual people have equal agency in what's allowed and what's not allowed in the public space. That is such an overstatement. None of us will be alive to see when LGBT people and heterosexuals have equal agency. Um, I'm pretty sure they do. I'm pretty sure I do. Like, I'm pretty sure I have more. I get away with so much more as a gay man. Right now, being a gay man is, it's like one of the best things you can be. Like, I feel like in London, people put you on a pedestal. Um, because I'm not a woman, I don't have to deal with the conversations around women's spaces with the trans issue and like the women's prisons and all that kind of stuff. So sometimes it makes me a bit uncomfortable because now I know that sometimes if I get an opportunity, like that may be a big part of it because, you know, companies are being like, tick. Oh, he's gay, tick. But I'm also confident in my ability, so who cares? Uh, me personally, I actually think Pride is uh, very necessary. I love it. I wouldn't say Pride parades. I right. feel like um, you guys are yeah. leaning towards like the parades itself. Mm -hmm. Pride is like liberation, you know. Just proud of I, who you are. And yeah, just and accepting just, yourself. Yeah, accepting yourself mm -hmm. and having the people around you in your circle really accept you. It really tells the future generation like not only is it okay, but look how far we. I really respect that, and I totally agree with everything he said. So they're obviously talking about the Pride parades here, but like, do I think Pride is necessary? Yes. Do I agree with how Pride is being done at the moment? No. I think the issue is that with all of this minority identity politics, everything needs a month. So it's like, we need Black History Month. So let's for a month care about Black people. And then for the rest of the year, we don't talk about their history. I don't think it's helpful. And also with Pride, like fine having a Pride parade, a Pride day, it makes sense. Get everyone in the same place at the same time. Pride month, I think, it's gone too far. Like, it is so in your face. You know, one month in June, every company changes their logo. You have Pride merchandise everywhere. It's being on all the buses, all the trains. Like, it's like push, push, push. And it's so in your face. And, you know, we are, we, we are we're a minority of people. Yes, we deserve to be celebrated and given equal opportunities and equal agency and all of that kind of stuff, but it is so in your face. And the thing about the LGBT community is, you know, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of mental health issues. I've, you know, had that myself, but I've never seen more narcissism anywhere in life than the LGBT community. The amount of people that want to be the center of attention, like me, 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 it's always this competition to like outdo each other, out bitch each other, out dress each other. And it gets really toxic. And I think an element of this month is like, look at me, look at me, celebrate me, validate me, lift me up. And then the other part of it is just so disingenuous because all of these companies are like, tick, tick, Lo logo tick, okay, email signature tick, diversity hire tick. And I don't think that's progressive. Actually, I think it's quite regressive. And if I'm someone who kind of like doesn't really get the whole LGBT thing, which, you know, fair to you, whatever, or like I, I don't know any LGBT people or I'm raised in like a really conservative background, then when June comes around, I'm going to be like, what the hell is going on? Like there is a rainbow. I, I can't open my eyes without seeing a rainbow and like rainbows are supposed to be relatively rare, you know. Be nice if I found a pot of gold somewhere, you know, in Pride Month, but you know, that's not happening. And all the money is being spent on this parade, but you see what I'm saying? Say thank you for your service oh, before I move you. on. And, and that's a, a prime example of the pride that I would love to attend, is someone who highlights service members, gay service members, gay CEOs, people who are successful, who are contributing to society. Celebrate who you are, love who you are, but the pride is no longer about being overly promiscuous because we're not allowed to. We don't need to overcorrect to the point that we start to get backlash. We need to correct our PR. But I still think we're looking at a small group of the people that are at pride. But the small said, groups, like, but they speak the loudest. You know, yeah, so I'll also agree to that. And with the guy from the military, like he said, we should be celebrating how far we've come. I think that's what pride should be about. Like what, that guy talked about the AIDS epidemic you know, this is a great time to be to celebrate and say, look at what society used to be like and look at where we are now. Let's celebrate our history because history is always important. It's important to know I existed 40 years ago. What would my life be like? And how can I appreciate 
these other men, these other LGBT people that made my life easier for me. I think that's so important. But then less so about the like, me, 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 like, look at me, look at me in the center of attention, winning this twerking competition. Like, I deserve all of this praise just because I was born, like, born this way. The LGB should be separated from the TQIA+. Mm. Mixed feelings. Okay, so I'm... Mm. You know what, I'm gonna walk forward on this one and I will explain it's not as, not as bad as you think. Raider is not saying that one is, you know, less important. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. I do want to start with that. But I do think that the LGB is very specific rooted in science. It's very clear as day. Um, you have lesbian, gay, and bi. Main difference between male and female, we all know what that is. The reason why I stepped forward with hesitation was because I think that there are such lived differences and experiences that we experience. Although collectively, I think that we all know the collective experience of being a sexual deviant. There just is a difference in lived experience that I think is is important to talk about and acknowledge, and that's my grounds for agreeing with perhaps a separation. So I can, see, I can see his point. I mean, when I grew up, I was kind of like, why am I LGBT? Because I'm attracted to people of the same sex, but I don't want to be the other sex. And I, I just couldn't understand like, how that was related. Now I understand it more because I think what we do share in commonality is growing up, yes, in a heteronormative world, again, nothing wrong with that, but growing up in that society and from a very young age as a child, starting to have these feelings that other people around us don't have, and trying to question ourselves and grapple with this, whether you are not straight or trans, those experiences are similar in terms of realizing you're different. And it is kind of like a mental, a real mental journey and mental process. So, and it obviously like it's related in the sense that, you know, it is kind of gender related, like overall, like, you know, liking the same sex and then identifying with the opposite gender. So I think it is related like that. So I think for, for that sense, I don't think we should separate like the T, but I'll come back to the rest. Amir said that LGB is based in science, but actually like the T as in like the regular trans people, born male, identifying as female transitions, that is very, very much based in science as well. I mean, re researchers have shown that on brain scans, like you can see a feminization of the brain when you're male to female, I think. Personally, from everything I've read so far, and you know, I may be wrong, but I do believe that it is largely biological. Now we can get to all the other stuff in a minute and all these extra identities, because I don't think those are. Very different. Uh, to be clear, the science is very solid on uh, identities other than gender assigned at birth being valid. Science is very clear, robust. There is no question that it's legit. We, as cisgender people, do a really bad job of standing up for people who aren't cisgender. So he's half right. I mean, the science is correct on, you know, like male to female and female to male, but non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer, agender, trigender, that's not based in science. It's based in a cult. These things don't make sense. The fact that cisgender queer people are treated differently than non-cisgender queer people. And until we do better, we don't deserve to have the letters be together. Much better grounds. What? Oh yeah, great point. We don't deserve to be with you people because you're more oppressed than us. Like, absolutely not. I, I, I honestly feel like LGB people have done a lot for trans people and vice versa. But also, like I said, all of these extra identities, non-binary, blah, blah, blah. I think they are massively massively bringing down the community and making us look like a joke in the eyes of these crazy right-wingers who don't really know what LGBT is. I'm not really sure what that is. And then they see some non-binary person saying that they have all this trauma because someone didn't refer to them as a they, them. Is my experience supposed to be like that? I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's talk about the hypocrisy because everyone all of these lefties would be like, that's cultural appropriation. That's white supremacy. Call out, call out, call out. That's fat phobia. But then I come along and say, it bothers me when a straight person from privilege who doesn't have anything interesting enough going on in their life that they then start identifying as non-binary. And now they are queer. And they're supposed to be 
in my area, <laughs> celebrating my history, our history, and running their mouth about being misgendered, marginalized, oppressed. And it's like, you are making this decision to put yourself in a box where you can actually actively prey on your oppression point. No, thank you. Do not enter, okay? Yes, more often than not, non-binary people are probably originally gay anyway, so like, fine, if the identity makes any sense because it relies on the fact that gender is a social construct and I don't believe that it's a social construct, so sorry. And I also think it's a really not healthy way to live by the sole factor that makes your identity exist is whether people refer to you as Z, Zer, or Fe, Fem, or they, them. Because otherwise, it doesn't exist because it doesn't exist. It's like, if I walk around and someone is like, you're not gay, gay isn't a thing. Well, I don't care because it's an objective fact. I sleep with men. I don't need you to say, hey, Jack, you sleep with men for it to be true. But you know what non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid, agender, what they need for it to be true is for you to use the pronoun. Otherwise it's not true because they are a man or a woman. If you're watching this, come to me in the comments because I'm very willing to be pilled on non-binaryism. I used to believe in it. I used to preach it all the time. I'm finding this quite embarrassing now, but if anyone can accurately dictate and articulate to me how non-binary is valid and what it means, then I will concede. Very happy to do that. But no one has been able to explain it to me in a way that makes sense. They're like, oh, I just don't feel like a man or a woman. What does feeling like a man mean? It's like, oh, I just don't really identify with like masculine things. So does that make you not a man? Like the T, no. Now when we're talking, like, I think the T means transsexual people. Privileged straight person saying they're non-binary. I'm like, no, thank you. Like, go find another hobby, please. And people will say this is mean, but if I decided that I identify as black, because that's more how I feel, I don't really feel white on the inside. Can you imagine the onslaught I would get? And the funny thing is, is that race actually is a social construct. It very much is. You know, we've categorized people based on these biological characteristics, but race is a social construct. Gender is not, but then someone's not allowed to identify as another race. I mean, I don't think anyone should do that. It's totally stupid, but, but then people are allowed just to identify themselves into my circle. Sometimes gatekeeping is a good thing. And this is one of those scenarios. I'm like, no, no, on your way. Intersex, I think that's great. But the thing is about intersex is that I don't, like I've never met an intersex person, so I might be wrong, but I don't know how many intersex people like actually identify with our community because intersex is like a medical condition, like a birth defect in sexual development. It doesn't mean that there's more than two sexes, but it's like, if you're born with a medical condition, like, are you going to identify with LGBT? Because most of them will, will sit in the binary anyway. Now there will be exceptions to this, but seeing as intersex people are like 0.0018 of the population or something, like how many of them want to be part of LGBT? And I sort of feel like this is another appropriation. What's another letter we can add to our alphabet of people that are different and need to be like marginalized and oppressed? It's the intersex people. So if you're intersex and you're like, I totally disagree, I want to be part of the community, I'm sorry. Like I don't, like I honestly don't know because there's a big question mark over that one. Um, asexual is interesting because like there's, there's no bigger difference between a gay man and an asexual person, you know what I mean? Like we're not gonna have that much in common. It's like one is like hypersexualized, like testosterone, like uh. if you're asexual and you're going to all of these events that are apparently like hypersexualized, then are you not gonna feel a bit out of place and uncomfortable? I don't know, I don't know. Like if you're asexual, comment below. And then the Q, I used to identify as queer, but you know, I don't anymore because I realize that queer is very much a political term. There's a very specific look to queer. It's all about like the gender non-conforming kink, the patriarchy. But then then again, the whole idea of a collective in general, I'm not really that a fan of. So, I mean, I, I kind of, I agree with what you're saying, but I think in general, this conversation can become very hostile because it, it seems like, you know, I. I'm like, oh, I don't want you to be a part, like, I don't want you to be my friend. I don't want, I don't want to be, be with you, be next to you, be seen with you. And that's not the case. One is an identity and one is a sexuality. And that's just the simple dif difference that's between the two.
eventually, as both groups are fighting for their own personal interests, those are going to not work cohesively. So one is going to be quieter and one is going to get taken advantage of, et cetera. And it's not that we can't support the TQ+. Right. I just think that they're two vastly different things. Exactly. So it doesn't mean that we're like, oh, we don't want to be associated with you at all. Like we can still support each other. But I guess the argument he's having, which I do agree with, is that for people that don't get LGBT, the more letters you, tr like once it's like A to Z, all these letters, then they're not going to, they're going to understand it even less. And I think they'll understand like what it means to be gay or lesbian, for example, better than if we're lumped in with all this extra stuff. And then we can also work on helping those people have their understanding. I think it's a good point. I think that you, you oversimplify identity versus sexuality though, because there are tons of men who identify as straight, who have on occasion, with regularity, once in their life, sex with men, which is why I there are lots of gay men that we are allowed, that we can call gay all day and all night that occasionally have sex with women, and we don't question whether they're or not bi. they're gay. They're but are you entitled to titling someone else's? Is, is, that, a, is that up to you? The, the title is an objective fact. If yeah. you sleep with men and women, then you are bi. What if someone... Can we not talk about who we're having sex with? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a weird request. You can experiment like as a one-off or whatever, that doesn't mean your sexuality is different. But if I'm gay and then like, I'm kind of every so often having sex with women, then, you know, I'm not really gay. Like you can't have it both ways. You want all these different labels to clearly, you want like pansexual, bisexual, agender. You want all these different labels, but then you can say, but you, you're not allowed to say what the label is because gay can mean whatever it wants. It's like, mm -mm, why do we have the label to begin with? Why are we trying to like differentiate someone so clearly? If then someone can be like, yeah, I'm gay, but I have sex with women. Yeah, I'm straight, but I have sex with men like 50% of the time. <laughs> no. I think it would be an incredible disservice to the transgender community who gave us a lot of the beginning for us to fight for our rights, a separation from them, now that we have our rights. That's just so privileged of us. Like Marsha P. Johnson threw that first brick at Stonewall, and because of her, she didn't throw the first brick. And she, or the she second, got there, she the got there at two a.m. First of all, and second of all, <laughs> his face is like, "Oh no, I've been caught out." I mean, get your facts right if you're going to bring them forward. He's like, "Why are you interrupting my lies?" We divorced because I'm a huge disability advocate. I have a mental health condition. It's very different from someone who uses a wheelchair. We still have a disability. What you're getting at is that we're a minority. Thank They're a minority. You. And the more that you take apart those minorities, mm -hmm. the harder it is for us to fight for our rights. I mean, I feel like we used to be a minority and now we have like LGBT, 2S, LGBTQIA+, LMNOP. So it's not really headed that way. The guy that gave the disability analogy, like I get what he means, but for me, like, for example, I have ulcerative colitis. It's an autoimmune disease. But if someone didn't really get health conditions and then they were just like, oh, yeah, like that guy is kind of the same as like someone who has schizophrenia, I would be like, well, no, like there's a distinction. I don't think you should lump us together. Am I going to relate to a person with schizophrenia? No. Like, do I have empathy for them? Absolutely. Can't we all, to some extent, identify underneath the queue? Your attraction maybe has shifted in some way to different types of men. Like, things are constantly evolving and, in my opinion, fluid. So to kind of force ourselves even into the LGB is to sit within the binary that doesn't help any of us anyways. I'm sorry, but what? I'm sick of this. I want to sit in the binary. I'm very happy sitting in the binary. I'm gay. I'm attracted to men. And this is exactly what I was talking about. It's like, you're not queer enough now. I'm no longer trendy enough because I'm gay, relatively masculine presenting. Although I do have my nails done. Do you like them? They're shellac. <laughs> it's like, I don't think that we should box ourselves into LGB. Why does it exist in the first place to define what someone is so that people can understand it? But now it's like, well, you can be G. We encourage you to broaden out your horizon. Like, off. Even in our conversation today, you guys are talking about a lot of anti-LGBTQ legislation. And as if I was a gay person watching, I would think, oh my gosh, like they're coming for my rights. I'm, they're coming for my rights. But a lot of times that legislation has to do with the TQ+. Plus. Is that the narrative that gay men are being attacked when other letters are not giving any merit to the attacks. It is confusing and it's harmful to young gay men and their success because they're force fed this it's narrative no that they can't. That's I agree with that. I mean, Again, there's a narrative being pushed 
for me to claim victim status and that I'm so oppressed and so marginalized and most straight people don't never understand me and never accept me. And that is actually tr not true. Most, the majority treat me with respect and I don't have to get along with everyone. I don't have to be everyone's friend, but in general, I have a really good life. And when it comes to this, these bills are getting misconstrued because the, the news will be like, oh, anti-LGBT laws. Like, what does that mean? Like, can you not be more specific? And everyone talks about the like, don't say gay bill in Florida. And people just think, oh my God, they're eradicating like gay, anything gay related from schools and the teachers aren't allowed to talk about being gay. But what it actually was, was not introducing gender ide ideological sex education for people under the age of like 12. It, like you're not allowed to like, say gay. It's like so simple. Like can people, and it's like, can we not call ourselves out and say, actually, like, this isn't as bad as we think. I passed one, of those, no one I one of those laws. I passed one of those laws in Nebraska that, was, that, that protects children under the age of 18 from receiving gender-affirming care and hormones. Because I've seen- And you're proud my, of that. Yes, I am very proud I of that. I am so ashamed because, of you. Because I have friends who had their first experience the with affirming care. Can, you, can I finish? Can, can I finish? <laughs> can I finish? Can I finish? Ding, ding, ding. So how do you know you're chatting with an ideologue? Someone who believes in something ideologically, and no matter what you say, no matter how many facts you present them, they won't budge. One of the signs is that if they don't have anything to say, they say you have internalized homophobia. So for example, if I was like, I don't think, um, you know, the, the gay dating apps should exist. I think they're over incestuous. I don't agree with that, but let's say I say that. It's like that, that opinion's valid. And then someone else is like, oh my God, the amount of internalized homophobia within you. It's such an easy, stupid, like, cop-out thing to say how do you know what's inside his mind you don't because you're not in it it's the same thing like every white person's a racist well have you been inside every white person's mind or is this just something tiktok is telling you and it's so rude imagine if i just walked up to someone on the street who disagreed with me and said like oh my god you just hate yourself the amount of self-hatred within you i think that is a horrible thing to say and clearly the law he's talking about let, let's just see what he's gonna say next to a young girl who her first experience with this type of care was a double mastectomy at 15. She's now 19, doesn't and know if she'll be able to. It's, it's actually not... very common. Because how common? I want a number. How Can common? I finish? How common? Can I this finish? Is, you, you passed you're the asking law? Me a... That's another ideologue situation is they don't let you speak because if they let you speak, you're going to present some valid facts and then you're not going to have two legs to stand on. So shut the conversation down, insult the person, tell them that they're self-hating. None of those are anything which actually debunks what they're saying. Question in the middle you of passed a law. You, you passed a law that affects so many kids from feeling like themselves. Yes, I did. Transgender I'm proud kids. of my law. Oh my that, that, that's unfortunate and I'm ashamed if of you because- that's what it's gonna take to get you to stop so I can finish my, my thought, I appreciate that. All right, you know so, what? I'm gonna shut up until you finish, but I would really like to say something when you're done. Sure. The person that I testified with who their experience was the a double one mastectomy. Person. Let, him finish, one let him person. finish, let him finish, let him finish. Are you one step in? Like, let him we... finish. Okay, it's getting really heated now. So how common, well, it's like, how common is a child trans? Is it 2%, 3%? Can you answer? I don't believe that children should be allowed to medically transition. And I believe my opinion is nuanced because in the past, when this was a very niche medical field and you had these kids who had gender dysphoria from like as young as they can remember, and by the time they get to 10, 11, 12 years old, it's like the parents have had like a decade of dealing with this issue. I think the success rates then were a lot more consistent, but now you have all these people coming out saying I'm gender dysphoric. And then like three months later, they're going to a gender affirming clinic, getting put on puberty blockers, getting surgeries before they're 18, which I don't think should be done to anyone. And there's a lot of children being harmed. Like the percentages of the, the girls identifying as men has gone up by 5,000%. Like that is not just because it's more accepted and transgender people have existed throughout history. It's always been heavily skewed of male to female and men having gender dysphoria from a very, very young age. And for those men that have it at a later stage in life, it's more of an autogonophilia situation, which I'm not gonna get into now, but you can obviously see that this man is coming from a good place. And he's like, I've met this girl who went through this horrible experience, this traumatic experience. But then this other guy, this denim guy, he doesn't care about that. And it's like, can you not see that I'm trying to care about the other side too? And I'm under the opinion that until the medical system is robust enough, that the risk of someone 
getting a double mastectomy before they're old enough to understand what they're doing or choosing to be infertile, having risks of like heart disease and bone density and having all those risks for the sake of, you know, living your truth. Until the system is robust enough and we don't have all these people slipping through the cracks, I don't think that it should be done. I think we need to take a step back and review it all. I'm not against it entirely, like there, there might be extreme cases, but the problem is that at the moment, we're not telling the difference between the extreme cases and the not, the people who actually need it. It's happening. All you have to do is Google on YouTube, detransitioners, and you have all these kids telling their story. Like I walked in and after one appointment, I got put on, to, on puberty blockers and then testosterone. And then everyone's like, oh, well, that was just like, that was just that doctor like had bad practice. And it's like, well, isn't that the whole point that it's the medical people that are doing it. So if bad practice exists here, then it might exist over there. And this is only the people who want to come online and share their story. People that have been through a traumatic medical experience. Do you know how many people don't want to share that online? A lot. So it very much is happening. But people talk. Okay, that one person was one person in Nebraska, but I know a plethora of other people. Hold on, let him finish. Let I know finish. a plethora of other people in other states the all over this country. The so easy. I know a plethora of people all okay. over the country. Let's pause can we can not do this? We'll like, what is, the, what, is, okay. what is the, can we let them talk? Let's just You're pause. gonna get time yeah. to talk. I don't it's appreciate okay. it. I know, it's I actually so disrespectful towards the transitioners that he's minimizing them like this and saying like, oh my God, the one person in America who, no. He's doing it because there's lots of people. And then the other guy, I'm so ashamed of you. Who's acting more apparently in this situation? Is it the conservative or the liberals? I'll let you make your own mind up there. He's furious you, too, but let's but let him deal. finish. I, he's pissed off more than you. And he's quiet. Just let him, you're gonna get your point out. I, Just let him. I'm talk. good, thank you. <laughs> Just let him I'm talk. Good. Okay. No, you're not. <laughs> you say how many people? You say it's a small subset, but for the people who it affects, it affects them for the rest of their lives. A decision they made, they made as a child will affect them for the rest of their lives. This person will never feel their Fine. sensation on their chest. They don't know if they're gonna ever be able to have a child and they know they will never be able to breastfeed. They will never be a woman in the regular senses. And this is happening more and more because we are conditioning our young people to say, hey, this is okay, this is okay. You can make these decisions. As a, as, a, as a senior in this community, I have to say, wait a second, you guys are kids. Wait till you have your whole lives. Let's talk about this. I'm sorry, but what did he say can you disagree with? Are people mental? Do you think at 12 years old, you could decide whether you want to cut your breasts off and never be able to breastfeed and then take testosterone and be infertile forever. Like how can kids consent to this? And we have, like I said, all these children slipping through the, through the cracks. So these guys are like, oh, well, it's fine if we have these children whose lives have been destroyed because then we have these other kids that we've helped. And that's not how medicine works, you know? Like sure, every medicine, a medical procedure has risks, but this is a very large percentage of people who regret it. So we're not just going to disparage one portion of people for the sake of the political correctness of the other. And the, the reality is that, like, yes, it may be painful for these transgender people to go through puberty, but all st studies show that up to 90% of kids actually desist in their feelings. And this is why I have another problem with it, because so many of these kids have come out and said, actually, what I was struggling with was just being gay or being lesbian. And because I don't feel like that's fully accepted in myself or within my circle, I felt like transitioning was the better option because, so as a gay man, I feel like I have a right to speak about this because there are young gay men and young gay women thinking that transitioning is the better option for them than just living as a homosexual. I'm sorry, but as long as that's happening, I'm not staying quiet about this. Honestly, shame on you for not going after the actual facts. I realize your anecdotal experiences um, move you and I respect and appreciate that, but let's be perfectly clear. The most permanent thing a kid can go through is puberty, first of all. So when you, when you deny a kid the opportunity to pause puberty, let, we're just talking, first of all, talking about puberty blockers. Which straight kids well, do on, all the time. All the time. So I hear this argument all the time, and there's a very clear distinction. So these were used on cisgender kids who would have precocious puberty. So they'd go through puberty too early, and that would start at like six years old. So they'd be put on these blockers, and then at the age of like nine or 10, it would they would, stop them and then go resume puberty. Now, this is creating an environment where the child goes through their puberty at the right time like other kids, because it's 
it's some sort of physical defect. It's like an issue with your hormones. Now with transgender kids, they're putting them on puberty blockers at 11 years old and they're staying on these blockers till they're 16 and then they're taking testosterone or estrogen. You're going to tell me that that's the same thing? Like the most important part in a human's development going through puberty that affects your entire body and your brain and your bone structure and your muscle mass and your fertility, you're gonna say that that's the same as putting a kid who's six years old who's getting their period too soon on puberty blockers. It's not the same. And all the scientific papers say <clears throat> that if you allow kids to go through their natal puberty, most of them will outgrow the gender dysphoria. Like gender dysphoria is just a symptom. It doesn't mean that you're trans. Like some, in some cases it will mean that you need to transition. And in some cases, there'll be another way to treat it. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. The assumption is that by blocking a child's puberty, they're not actually b being given the chance to outgrow the feeling. And I'm all supportive of trans people, and I think it's amazing that we can offer trans people this care and that any adult that needs it should be given it. But the reality is that it's actually really hard to live like that. You're on, you're on synthetic hormones for the rest of your life. You have to, potentially you're going to go in for like very, very serious invasive surgeries. And it also can affect your life expectancy and you can have many medical problems due to it. So if there's, if there's a chance that some of these people don't need to go through that experience, not to mention like the stigma of having to be trans, then why are we, I mean, the answer is that money. And this is what these people just don't want to admit. Like it is huge. The amount companies are profiting off this. <sighs> Okay, let's go to the next question. Drag shows are too sexual for minors. So I, I'm gonna walk forward on this one. I think it's important to not put a blanket statement over everything. I was just gonna say um, that. Because I know already when so they all the that we're gonna get the missed out fire example. None of the liberals. And then it's gonna be like, oh, well, why is that okay for kids and drag is not? I love a good drag show. I frequent them all the time. Most of them are not appropriate for children. Most of them. Not all, but most of them. There are instances that are circulating on social media that represent a small minority of drag shows you see the guy where in the kids back are present so and they are sexualized, Why are you pleasuring themselves, wearing outfits that are representative of genitalia. For that reason, I would say that drag typically is not appropriate for children. Yeah. Do I think it needs to be legislated? No, because I don't trust the government to legislate it responsibly, but I do trust parents I to that. use their better judgment Very and know that when something is typically it. sexual, it most likely will be, so just don't take your kids there. I wouldn't equate it to like banning drag, but I would say it's similar to, we have the First Amendment of, well, we don't in the UK, but the US has this First Amendment of free expression for, you know, everyone. But, and you know, you could argue that a strip club is part of free expression, but does that mean then that we offer those to kids? No. So I wouldn't call it banning drag. I would call it like what content is age appropriate. It's the same as like a movie being 18 plus. That's free speech, but does it mean that it's available to kids? I child who wore my sister's clothes. I wore my mom's makeup. I put on their heels. I did all the things. I just explored my, you know, who I was. Feeling comfortable expressing yourself and, and being around drag could be like for a kid like me, if I saw that it was okay to dress up and, and nobody was like shaming me, maybe that could be helpful, but that doesn't change the fact that the majority of drag shows that we see today are sexualized. So I fully agree with that. I mean, we should encourage kids to express themselves, play with their expression, you know, instead of just having to adopt another label, but that's another thing. But the issue is that drag as a culture and as a performance is most of the time hypersexualized. All of RuPaul's Drag Race is like sexual jokes, sexual innuendos, always talking about dick. It's dirty, you know, it's vulgar, very vulgar. And like, not to mention the outfits are like these massive boobs, this crazy makeup. If I'm a kid and I'm going to watch a drag show and it's like in a library, I mean, the whole drag queen story, everything, I just find a bit creepy. Like, whose idea was that? <laughs> Sorry, I find it creepy. I mean, if, if my kid was like, I'm gonna go to the library and watch a couple of clowns, like, read to me, I'd be like, I think that's kind of weird. Like, maybe you shouldn't. But anyway, um, if I were to go and watch them and be really inspired by these drag queens and say, oh my God, wow, like, I love them and stuff, great. But then what's that kid gonna do? They're gonna go home and start Googling. I'm not talking about like an eight-year-old here, right? 
you're going to start googling drag queens they're, they, they're going to want to watch RuPaul's Drag Race and this is where like the line gets blurred because if your whole industry is going to be in inherently hypersexualized, then saying oh we're now going to branch off and create a kid version I don't think those two things work it's like strippers saying yes we're, we're hypersexualized but now we're going to put on a more conservative outfit and go read to kids I mean, I think that would even be more appropriate because the kids wouldn't even know they're strippers. <laughs> they wouldn't know to go Googling the strippers. Like drag queens, yeah, that they, they do. Um, and then that's not to mention that there have been many drag shows for kids that actually are disgusting. I'll try and find a clip of one of those and put it here. Anyway. It's an easy way to go after us. I don't think most people that don't like drag shows or angry about drag shows actually care about drag shows or have ever, have ever even been to one. You know, I think when you go, I, you said majority, I've not been to all the drag shows. I can't speak for the majority, but I've been to my fair share in New York and LA, like places where the queens turn out. They put on a show. It is not about being sexual. It's about being smart, funny, witty. They make their costumes, Even they do their makeup. The it is art, is art entertaining. I don't think they get enough respect for what they do. He's not made any point. It's art, it's entertaining. It's like, so is porn. That's entertaining. It's expressive. So does that mean it's not sexual? And it's sad that drag is kind of being painted that way for everyone when there are a lot of people that are doing beautiful work. But what do you think when it does I think people, cross people the line who are, like, of being inherently sexual? afraid of drag as an art form then go to the one thing that they can, which is like, oh, the sexualization of the minor. Like, mm -hmm. but I, I yeah. which, which I think, you know, such a dog whistle. They're not taking down all the naked statues that are like all over Italy and like well, in yeah. the Catholic Church. Like, you know what I mean? Like naked babies. If you're gonna like say, well, that's a good point. None of none of the like sexualization sexualization of children or none of the inappropriateness. Then you have to go after it all. all of it. But those statues, though, are not, there's nothing sexual about them. They're just like a depiction of a nude human. Whereas drag queens are all about like the boobs and the ass and the lips and, you know, very stereotypical views of like sex, sexy women. You know, I, I think it's quite different. All the jokes they tell are innuendos. So I have been editing all of this on my phone. Can you believe it? It's like 20 gigabytes. <laughs> I just bought a MacBook, so... There's going to be so much more high quality stuff coming, but my phone is absolutely busted trying to process this file. So I have a response to one more of the questions and I'm going to post that separately. I hope you enjoyed everything I discussed today. I would love to hear what you agree with, what you disagree with. Let me know if you want me to react to anything else. If you're interested, if you enjoyed my content, please like the video, subscribe and all the good stuff. And I will see you next time.